Hello, everybody. It's Jake Sensi, our host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best-selling author in purple today, the G Daddy, Gino Barro. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, I finally got you over to the dark side. We're in the pinks. We're in the pastels, my friend. I love it. How you doing, bro? Dude, I thought I was in Florida today. Always making it happen, <laughs> big man. So today's guest is Paul Moore. Paul was a finalist for the Michigan Entrepreneur of the Year two years in a row. After selling his staffing firm that he co-founded, he began investing in real estate founded multiple investments and development companies and co-managed a successful multifamily development. So without further ado, Paul Moore, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here, but I feel like I need to change my shirt. <laughs> Dude, you're coming on to a, a fruity place right now, my friend. So you may have to, but let's, uh, let's get into this. So, uh, Paul, I was, I was reading a little bit about your bio. I saw the staffing firm, you're getting into real estate. My question is, why are you so hard on yourself? Both are ridiculously challenging. It's hard to find deals right now. And everyone knows that hiring great people is probably harder than, you know, finding a great real estate deal. So, so what is up with this, this, this pursuit of challenge that you have going on here? Man, the staffing firm, I fell into that. I worked at Ford Motor Company for five years in their headquarters arena, you know, area in Detroit and Dearborn, Michigan. And I, I looked ahead and saw these people, you know, who were 10, 20, 30 years ahead of me and th looking at their jobs thinking, man, I just, I really love Ford. I still drive a Ford, but I just don't want to do what they do. And so my friend had this idea for a outsourced HR company. And so we put together this staffing firm and we did that for about five years. We sold it to a publicly traded firm in 97. I, I did learn that, you know, being an entrepreneur is a lot harder than it looks. It's really fun to start something new, but like the e-myth talks about, you know, the book, the famous book, the e-myth, it's much harder to run a company than to start one and uh, had a lot of challenges. A lot of fun stuff happened during that, those years and um, ended up exiting that in 97, started investing in real estate in 2000 and flipping houses before flipping was a thing was very fun mm -hmm. until it wasn't. <laughs> so Paul, let's go back to the staffing real quick. When we're out there as entrepreneurs hiring, what are you looking for or what, how do you, how do you qualify? Yeah, what's somebody? the secret sauce, man? This is, this is what everybody needs right here. More than multifamily. How are you yeah. finding the right folks? Man, so you guys, you, you've been to a Chick-fil-A drive through a Chick-fil-A restaurant, right? I mean, you got a you, bunch you of kidding? kids. You kidding yeah, me right, right now? You know, like I I'm know. the biggest fanboy for Chick-fil-A in the world. Come Are on. you? I didn't know. Dude, uh, dude come on. So, man. Come on, man. Chick-fil-A, I mean, let's face it, it, with rare exceptions, when you go through their process as, an, as a customer, you're going to get a great experience. You're going to have, like, you're going to walk away feeling cared for. When my daughter, Abby, gets her Chick-fil-A sandwich, at Chick-fil-A, you know, she feels like she feels loved at the same time. And mm -hmm. so we go to Chick-fil-A partly for the experience. Chick-fil-A's experience is brought on because they've got great people. Sure, they have good strategy and good food and great processes and a cool drive through line and all that, but great people is what makes it happen. And I think in any business, you know, they've asked, they've pulled these super wealthy CEOs and billionaires and, all this, and, you know, overwhelmingly, they said great people was the best part of why they grew their business or why it failed in other times. But think about it. We've got science to figure out everything. There's processes and science and all these methods to do, you know, whether it's chemical formulas or pharmaceuticals or any number of a thousand things, but the most important thing, hiring great people, we don't have a set process for. I call it voodoo. I mean, I actually got this from these guys called this, this book called Top Grading. And it's the same process Chick-fil-A uses. They call it voodoo hiring, where you go out and you just like basically throw in darts, darts blindfolded at a board. And that's how most of us hire if it's the most important thing, let's make a process out of it. Let's make a science out of it. And that's what Chick-fil-A has done well. And I think that's what's really important for people to think about doing when they need to hire and staff up. Love that. Why did you get into flipping homes? What drew you to that? I mean, that's a, that is a tough endeavor to start out with in the real estate space. Yeah. So He the likes a challenge, you know. That's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, the year was 2000 and my friend and I were <laughs> bored. I had sold my company, had money in the bank. I didn't know what to do. I was actually trying to look busy so my wife and kids would think I was doing something, but I was actually really bored. And my, I heard that you could buy houses for like 50 cents on the dollar at the courthouse steps. So my friend and I went on an icy day in December and we Where went to you? the courthouse steps to Martinsville, Virginia. Now Martinsville, Virginia had, and I haven't verified this exact number, but if I recall, it was 22% unemployment at the time because textiles and furniture had all mm -hmm. pulled out of that area and went overseas with NAFTA and everything. And so I went there with no money at all. I had my wallet, but I didn't have a checkbook to be able to bid on a house because I just wanted to view it. We got to the courthouse steps. We'd already driven around this house and we comped it best we knew how for about $65,000. And it looked like the appliances were there. We looked through the windows. It looked like it was in fine shape. And uh, we, we got there and we thought, man, if anybody gets this below 50, it's going to be an amazing deal. And we got there. We were the only people on the courthouse steps and they opened the bidding at 32000 so we begged the auctioneer to let us run to the bank and back, got a check, and we bought the house and we sold it FISBO for sale by owner after just adding a coat of paint to the main floor three weeks later for full price at 65000 And we thought, this is easy. We can do this once a week. <laughs> <laughs> then we lost money on two of our next three deals. A person with money meets a person with experience person with the experience gets the money and the person with the money gets the experience. It sounds like you got a lot of experience. I did. And that. I got a podcast called how to lose money. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what transition? I mean, how did you go from that to multifamily? What, what was that? What was the, 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 I guess the epiphany of saying this ain't working. This multifamily thing looks pretty good here. Yeah. So we did dozens of flip homes and we only lost money on like four out of, I think, 60 or 70 homes. So it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, they let me paint a closet once. So, <laughs> hey, you know, I felt pretty good about that. I think they repainted it after I left, but I'm not sure. But um, anyway, then I started flipping waterfront lots and I thought, oh, that that was the most money I ever made per hour, by the way, like flipping mm -hmm. waterfront lots at a lake during the you know housing boom of like 2004 to seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I built an online real estate business. I still have running in the background, generating commission from selling leads to realtors. Um, I had done a bunch of things and I wanted to figure out how to get into commercial, but I didn't know how syndication wasn't as famous, you know, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. but uh, about 10 years ago, I had invested in an oil and gas deal in the Bakken oil rush in North Dakota. And we realized there were like 18,000 job openings there. And a lot of the problem was there was no housing. There were mm -hmm. 10,000 people, for example, descending on a little town called Watford City, North Dakota, a town of about 3,000. And so they were sleeping in their cars, their pickups. It was 40 below, you know, in the winter there, uh, you know, sometimes with the wind chill. And so we're like, um, maybe we should just build a multifamily complex. And we did. Guys, you know, if you look at apartment rentals across the country, they rent for, you know, roughly a, thou a dollar per square foot per month. I mean, let's just say in the heartland, you know, a thousand square foot apartment might rent for a little over a thousand a month. We were renting. So a, a dollar per square foot is my point. We were renting for $13 a square foot and staying full. It was awesome. We had wow. a good time. Wow. So from there, you build your first one. Do you start investing or do you continue to build? I want to know what happened to that because it sounds like that crashed or something. <laughs> yeah, so oil was 100 to $110 a barrel at mm -hmm. some points while we were operating that. So we were staying full. We were operating it as a corporate suites, like hotel mm -hmm. slash you know, long-term stay kind of thing. And guys, you'll like this. It's, it's embarrassing. But when we went to sell it years later, they said, okay, do you have your rent roll? I said, what's a rent roll? And uh, I didn't say it that way. But seriously, I didn't even know what a rent roll was. So I went back and got into a mentoring program. And I cannot tell you how important it is to get good coaching and good mentoring. And that's why I appreciate you guys. Because I tell people, I told somebody the other day, I said, man, check out Jake and Gino. You, you, you got to get mentoring and coaching if you really want to grow. So I did that. 
And that's when I jumped up to, oh, we did sell that, by the way, when oil was $100 a barrel. So it went great. Mm. Oh, good, good. I was like, um, I was like waiting for like, you're talking about losing money before. I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait, wait, what happens with this? Yeah, so oil, oil went down to $30 a barrel, but we had built this nice place so nice that the company that bought it did okay. Good. Um, yeah, but um, anyway, then my business partner built a Hyatt hotel, which was a complete disaster with all the funds he made from that. So that was really rough. But uh, at any rate, then I got into multifamily syndication, and that was like seven years ago. So you had mentioned the mentor, Paul, getting into syndication. How would you tell you know anyone listening to this? There's so many different ways to get into multifamily. What attracted you to the syndication aspect of it? You know, um, I really believed, I falsely believed at the time that I could really attract investors. And I, I thought I had some friends who were in China and they worked with large, very large investors there who were investing, you know, like $50 million or more at a time in U.S. commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I can connect with them and I can connect with my friend in Dallas who's got money and all this. And so I just thought that I could, could do that. And that turned out to be my Achilles heel for a number of years because I didn't follow my mentor's advice. I mean, basically, he was saying, you need to develop a broad coalition, if you will, a broad list of investors who will put in a relatively small amount of money each and grow it from there. So, you know, a list of, let's say, 500 investors who, might, you know, 100 might go in on a deal at 70,000, 100,000 each, maybe. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe him. And after two years of beating my head up against the wall, believing that two or three big investors would take down all our deals, I had, I actually was on a call with my, my business partner, my 24 year old employee who'd been with me for three years since college and, and, and all this with my mentor. And my mentor said, listen, you haven't listened to me for two years. Don't call me again until you listen and do what I said. So how do you start? I mean, having zero people on an investor database, I can tell zero. you, our, I can tell you our journey in 30 seconds. Yeah. And MM, then MM one, our first multifamily mastery, we have maybe hundred people on a list because we're doing a podcast. We have that event. All of a sudden we track 30 people. Jake decides to write another book. We attract more people. We start a podcast. We attract more people. We start the Jake and Gino community. We attract more people. But this is the ground game. This is the long game that you need to have. You need to create a credibility book. You need to have some type of business plan and out, out there winging. What did you do yeah. to start from zero to hero? Yeah. So that same month that I had all this, you know, just had to face my failure, I found this little purple app on my iPhone called the podcast app. And, you know, everybody knows about that, that has an iPhone, but I didn't. I and I click, <laughs> what's that? I don't even know about it. <laughs> yeah, let me find it on here. Actually, I do recommend no, I'll take your word for it. I was just like, I don't, I don't, tell me about this little thing. My yeah, dad calls so, the phone the magic box. So we're like, we're a little behind at times. You know? so. <laughs> so I put in raising capital in the search terms and I came up with this podcast and I clicked on it. And I listened to a story and it's kind of a silly story, but it's changed my life. So let me tell you about it real quick. If you want to live up north and you love salmon, you really want to feast on salmon and you have no, you know, you're away from civilization, you can become a spear fisherman, which means you have to learn to cut the limbs. You have to learn to whittle it. You have to learn to throw the spear. You have to hope that a salmon will swim by in a dark stream and you might have salmon for dinner sometimes that's one way to do it the other way this is where the analogy gets silly uh the other way is to become a grizzly bear if you're a grizzly bear standing with your jaw unhinged in a waterfall and i saw this in alaska last year salmon are jumping up all around you and some will jump into your mouth in fact a lot will and you'll get really fat if you're a grizzly bear standing in a waterfall well, being a grizzly bear is what we need to be if we want to raise capital. And it's exactly what you guys excel at, because basically it meant for me writing a book on multifamily, which I did. Uh, it meant starting a podcast. It meant becoming a guest on podcasts. Uh, I started blogging for Bigger Pockets. I started doing video for Bigger Pockets. I started doing webinars and speaking. And when I did all that, 
I didn't even have to sell anymore. People started coming to us mm -hmm. asking to get on our investor list. And eventually many of them invested with us. And to me, that is the key to building a base of investors. And you, you, you know, guys the problem is so with well. the analogy though, it's like around lunchtime and I'm seeing a bear catch all this fish in its mouth and I just want to eat now. It's a great analogy, Paul. <laughs> like I, I, I want to be the bear. That's wonderful. <laughs> you guys are. <laughs> no, I'm like, literally, I want, I want fish yeah. jumping oh, in my mouth literally. right now. Like he's I, hangry. That's what he's saying. Hangry yeah, right now. Like, yeah, he's hangry. You're getting all I that protein that. and like, mm, let's go. Yeah, that's I, right. I want everyone to write this down because this is very important. What Paul just said, it's called inbound marketing. Okay. Now I get it. Okay. okay so I'm, it, Jake, <laughs> let me pull this. Let me pull this back with Mr. Grizzly bear. And, and you start small. You don't have to, don't be overwhelmed by everything that Paul has mentioned. Just get out your laptop and write an article and yes. post it on people's websites. Be a contributor, seek to serve. Then you know what? Get in front of a camera, look stupid like I did five years ago and continue to look stupid, but that's okay. And try to give of yourself, but be passionate about it and try to teach others. And now you have a blog and you have a little vlog, video blog or a little YouTube. And then yeah. from there, maybe write a book or write two books yeah. or write three books. Man, it, Gino's dealing right now. It's really small. <laughs> and then you know what? Have a meetup. Start a little cafe yeah. or a coffee shop at a meetup and you have three friends and six months later you've got 42 people knocking at your door who want to come and that's how it starts but it has to start and you have right. to i think with consistent, the mentorship is you got to start but be consistent with it though but it's not small just, yeah. small steps we want to take that really big bite instead of saying you know what let's mm. reverse engineer it Take out yeah. my boys. Kill me right now. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to lay a roadmap here. And he's talking about food. It's the roadmap. You got 52 weeks. Think about 12 months and reverse engineer. By the end of the year, you want to have a five articles written, ten videos, six meetups, and everyone's got to come to MM4 October 23rd and 24th at the Gaylord yes. Palms. Make sure you go to those events. We're having our fourth meet, a fourth event, over 600 people. But do that. Reverse engineer. Why do you know? Why? Because, because it's the financial vacation for smart people. My work here is done. That's what it comes down to. And we're going to have salmon there too, just because Jake Thank wants you. some salmon. Okay. Whoa. I mean, those omega threes, all right? <laughs> but that's what you need to do reverse engineer it and don't become overwhelmed because that's what happens to a lot of us. We want to have 100 people on our invested database. If you can get one person a week to sign up at the end of the year, you're going to have 52 people. And then you know what? Year two, you're going to get two to three people signing up. And by the yeah. year year three, you're going to have 700 people on this list that you're serving. So Start trust me. Yeah. Yes, it starts to snowball. Paul, do you mind sharing with us our, your first deal, your first raise, how that went on your first syndication? Yeah. Um, so not counting the ones we did earlier as I wouldn't call them syndications. I mean, where we just raised from friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, when we put the word out in, uh, I think it was October um, of a certain year, actually it was October 2016 or 17. We put the word out for 125 unit multifamily in Lexington, Kentucky. And we did a webinar and we had a $50,000 minimum. It was a 50, you know, it was a um, reg D uh, uh, regulation D offering. And so it was accredited investors only mm -hmm. and 506 C. That's what I was trying to get at. And um, we had, uh, I think we had 52 investors and we raised approximately three and a half million dollars. And it was why did you go with 506 C on your first one? I mean, usually, I guess you might have been doing it for a while, but the majority of people, even Jake and myself, we started with 506 Bs because we were afraid that we wanted to go to friends and family that we didn't yeah. have have that network. Even though we had a lot of people, we were afraid that you know what, if we're not letting yeah. people in on it. So, what was your thought process? Yeah, you know what, I got to correct myself. We've done like five 506 Cs, but we actually did a B the first time, but okay. we only limited it to accredited investors. So it okay. was gotcha. a similar, you know, to a C in that how way. How big was the um... How big was the pond that you're fishing in? So you said you had 52 investors. How many people at that point did you have built up that you could offer to? I think we had about 150 to 200 investors it's on our conversion, list. great conversion, 25% yes. or more. But it's fantastic. this yeah. is, we had a really unique thing happen that I've never ha had happen in my entire career before or since. We had one guy that came to us. You know the guy, right? The guy, this guy came to us and goes, I can bring you so many investors in my friends and family network. And I was like, 
Yeah. Yeah. I've heard it before, you know, <laughs> and we've all heard it. Right. Yeah. And this guy actually delivered, he brought us like 30, uh, 25 or 30 of those 52 investors wow. all came through him. What a stud. Yeah, he really is. And he's a great he's guy. The bear. He, he is. I mean, he just had this incredible network of people that trusted him. So yeah, that's how it went. And uh, we closed in December and we went from there. What was the learning lessons from that raise? What, what really did you take out of it? Hmm. Um, you're the first person to ever ask me that. And I have to, to, to think about that for a minute. Um, I think <laughs> one the thing- book off. What do we got going back? Yeah, I think one thing was the fact that I had a book. I had a book that's uh, about multifamily investing. And I learned the power of that book. And I, I know you know that, guys. But I just learned that, you know, this guy's an author. This guy was on HGTV. This guy, what I was on HGTV once as a realtor, you know, in two. Promote that shit. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, but it mattered, yes. you know? Yeah. And so... And, and I realized going back to our bear analogy, guys, you know, that, you know, if you write an ebook, if you have a podcast, if you have a book, I mean, you get status, you get credibility that's much, much higher than you deserve. And mm -hmm. that is powerful. And that should give hope to every one of your listeners who's wondering how to get there. Three questions that everyone needs to answer when they're raising capital. Can you help that person? Obviously, yeah. Paul could help those investors. Can they trust you? And do you know them? If you can answer those three questions affirmatively, yes, then you've got yourself an investor. And people need to know you. They, they sometimes don't even look, look at the IRR. They look at Paul Moore, the person. He's got a track record. Mm -hmm. He's done deals. He's been in so many different businesses and so many different ventures. I trust him. I don't know what the IRR looks like, but I want to invest in his deal. So everyone, keep that in the back of your mind. And how do you do that? by being on podcasts, by being authentic, by sharing your story, by giving value and not expecting anything in return, the long game, right? Playing it out after six months, yeah. after 12 months, meeting people at a coffee shop and doing a meetup. All of a sudden they start to like you. They start to hear your voice. You're part of their day and that will change everything. It's a longer game, but let me tell you everybody, it's so worth it. So yeah, it's really true. And uh, so here's a quick example. We're thinking about adding ATMs to our next fund. Yes. And we, I was really, really reticent about this. I was like, wait, 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 wait. We've all we've talked about is real estate for years. I mean, for me, for two decades, ATMs. I mean, I get the, that they cash flow well, and I get that they have hundred percent depreciation in year one and all that. That's great. But ATMs. And I started asking investors and people started saying just what you said. They said, well, look, we know you are pretty careful and, they essentially said, if you trust it and you're investing in it, we're with you. Mm -hmm. it, it, Dave Zook spoke at MM2 and he is the ATM monster and he loves them for the depreciation. It's just yeah. like any other niche. You need to know where to buy them. You need to know the locations, really important. You can buy them in portfolios, mm -hmm. but it's just like anything else. Once you learn that and you master it. I, I have two questions before the short. It seems like you've had, I don't want to call it a shiny object because you've been successful, but yeah. what, what, in, what niche or what business have you really enjoyed the most uh, in your career? You know, I was going to get a, um, I actually was thinking if I, if I could go over to my desk and bring it back, I've got a, a whole bunch of business cards from different things I've done. I, there's tons of things I've done over 30 years. I haven't even mentioned like starting a wireless internet company investing in oil and gas, being a copywriter. I mean, I had all these business cards and I actually was proud of this. And I'm going to be very serious with you right now. You know, we're joking around a little here, but um, that was a big mistake. Uh, chasing shiny objects, being a serial entrepreneur, which is what I introduced myself as for a while. Uh, my friend ran for governor of Colorado and he said he rubbed shoulders with, you know, people like billionaires and these wealthy uh, famous people. And he said, the one thing they had in common is they found one thing they loved and they stuck with it doggedly said no to all kinds of distractions. And he was the guy who did the Hyatt hotel that crashed and burned. And he said, that was a distraction from what he really knew. Mm -hmm. And so I will say to people, it's really, really important, you know, read the one thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papazon, and just apply that to your life. And think about really dialing in and becoming an expert 
in one or maybe at most two things that you're really, really passionate about. For me, it's been what I'm doing now. And I'm not just saying that for, before it was the waterfront lots thing I did in 2004. But really, I just I absolutely love what we're doing now. I love getting to meet people like you connecting with people, you know, in my own audience as well writing. I'm writing a book on Warren Buffett's principles for real estate investors. I love it. And I'm, I've never had a better time in my life. A lot of uh, funny things you're saying right now, because I, I was reading today, and I think it was in the book Essentialism, which is very yeah. similar to the one thing. It's just a little more, you know, fancy or whatever, but very similar. And okay. uh, I, I think in that book, they're actually talking about Buffett has about 10 investments that he's held for the long term that made yes. up 90% of his wealth. So you brought up Buffett. And then the funny thing earlier was you were bringing up Michael Gerber and he was yeah. on the show a couple of weeks ago battling Gino about get out of the education business, do the one thing that you guys have been doing, buy apartments, hold them, expand the enterprise. And it's just that so many common themes from people with experience that just keep coming back. It's like, get good at it, hold it for the long term, you know, stay in your lane, yeah. uh, I think is, uh, is uh, very crucial. So but Paul, to your point, you weren't ready maybe when you were younger. That, yeah. that wasn't your journey. Your you journey was, then, was yeah. the shiny object. And that's where it's led to you now to where your life is fantastic. So we can't say whatever we did in the past was a mistake because that's the, that's the information that we had at yeah. that point in time. So now people that are listening to this, I hope it resonates with them because our experience that Jake and I've had over the last 10 years, you know, writing the honeybee, it's really all about multifaceted multifamily. We stay in our lane in multifamily, whether it's the education the syndication, the writing of the articles, whatever that looks like, but it took us several years to fall upon that. So for anybody out there listening to it, Michael Gerber said it best, go back and listen to the podcast. It was back in, in the middle of May. It's a job. Then, then it's first it's practice, then it's a job, then it's a business. And then ultimately it turns into an enterprise. And each one of these, you know, two or 300 units that we have, think of them as mini enterprises. And if you can think of it that way, you know, multifamily or self-storage, you want to become an entrepreneur in that space. And how you do that is by learning business principles and then applying those principles and staying in your lane and becoming an expert in that area. That makes it's sense, Paul? Tough. I love it. That makes Thanks. a lot of sense. I like it. And, and you know what? I do look at my path and see, oh, like I, if you can, if you can imagine this, I actually got sucked into doing a cost segregation thing for a while, like in 04. Like I was helping my friend launch his business doing that, you know. So these little things along the path, they they are part of the whole picture now, and I'm really mm -hmm. glad for that. But mm -hmm. you're 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 right. That that's a, that's really well said. I love Good that stuff. Gina. Last question: Why are you not buying multifamily right now? You are killing Jake and Gino. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but no. <laughs> um, I'll be honest. So, you know, like I'm a pretty uh, transparent guy. I mean, after all, I've got a podcast called How to Lose Money. I think you guys were both on there years ago. Um, I, um, we did not have the acquisition team that you guys had. And I remember when you guys, I, I seem to remember, weren't you in New York City at one point? And then New you, York you know, City. Yeah. Like then moved to, you know, the Knoxville, then Florida. I know all that. I remember a lot of Correct. that story. And I was looking for some of that picante. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we didn't have a great acquisition team. And as a result, we banged our head up against the wall. Is that the right word? Beat our head against the wall for years looking for great multifamily deals. And we concluded that there was not a lot of meat left on the bone. There wasn't a lot of value add deals left. I've heard that 93% of large multifamily are owned by companies, people who have already done the value add, people mm -hmm. who are already running them pretty well. But self-storage and mobile home parks are quite different. 85% of the 44,000 mobile home parks in the U.S., are run by mom and pop operators. They don't have the desire, the knowledge, the money, the resources to upgrade these and to run them professionally. Why should they? The cap rates have already gone from like 12 to 6% in mobile home parks. They can be mediocre and make millions when mm -hmm. they sell. So mm -hmm. they don't need to run a great one. But the good news is a great operator can come in in self-storage and mobile home parks and upgrade these and literally double the investor's equity, sometimes in as little as a year. 
And so it's a very, very exciting place to be. We love multifamily. Every one of our funds, we've got three, we're about to launch a fourth, has multifamily slotted in there. We just haven't found the right deals. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think it's interesting too, because we, going back to that long-term thing where we maybe get one large deal a year that really makes sense. And we've, the interesting thing is you can buy from some of these folks that you think, oh, this is like institutional type stuff. Everything that we've bought from a large company has basically doubled in value since we purchased it. It's just wow. having that acquisitions team to find it. And so it's building yeah. out that the infrastructure to bring in the deal flow. And then what we've been able to do is if we have 150 units, we're looking to add maybe a 50 unit or a 30 unit next yeah. to it to get those economies to scale. And we've done very well at managing the scattered site to fill nice. in the gaps if the deal flow is you know slow at times and still nice. you know, picking up and, and expanding that enterprise. So guys, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one -on -one mentorship, on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team. And I want to let you know this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to jakeandgino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right, we're back. And, and there's one other thing that I want to say that Paul was touching on earlier. We were, we were talking about Chick-fil-A a little bit, but really whether it's self-storage, whether it's, it's multifamily, very similar to Chick-fil-A and the McDonald's model. We're buying real estate and then we have a service to provide for people. And that's why this real estate game is so interesting. You can expand the enterprise over, you know, start in one city, expand to the next one and keep building upon that same thing, doing that one thing over and over again and getting really good at it while offering a high level of service. In the, and you're, you're touching on like the, uh, the self-storage and things like that. Have you guys expanded in terms of what you're doing with your customer experience to be more like a Chick-fil-A or any value adds there to add that higher level service? Yeah, so just to be clear, our fund actually finds portfolios, finds managers, sort of like the Buffett model, you know, we go out and find a great company and we invest heavily with them. Mm, gotcha. And so basically our operations are just basically the investor side. We're bas basically a secure investing in securities, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, when we invest in their portfolio. So our operators are doing a fabulous job. They have all kinds of value adds. I mean, when I first... <laughs> Jake, when I first heard of value adds in, in self-storage, I laughed. I mean, I thought, what, four, four pieces of sheet metal, some rivets and a door? How, how can there be any value adds? But I found out that, the, you know, you can add U-Haul. U-Haul alone, if you want, in a minute here, I can run the math on that for you. But U-Haul alone can significantly upgrade your NOI and your value of your facility. Paul means bringing U-Haul in and actually renting from the self-storage site. Yes. Yeah, basically renting out of the front office yeah. there, or the self-storage so site. So tell me you, about that. Are you renting the space to U-Haul and then do you get anything on top of that? Or how's that deal cut? Yeah. So what happens is you sign a deal with U-Haul and they give you a commission to park their trucks there and to use you use your location as a truck rental, you know, facility, a third party truck. rental. So is facility. there leasing involved as well for the space and then a commission on top of no, it? No, there's no leasing for the space. It's just a commission for the trucks and it can go anywhere from obviously zero, but up to 5,000 a month is my, the, the best one I know Dude, of. And it's awesome. just South, just South of you, Gina, 
Uh, there's one that goes for 5,000 a month that I know of, and there may be other ones that are better than that, but mm -hmm. that's uh, like the investment world I know. Imagine adding 5,000 a month to your bottom line. That's $60,000 a year. Divide $60,000 a year by a cap rate of, let's say, what, 6%. And I don't know what that number is, but it's probably in the eight or $900,000 range. If you buy a $3 million self-storage facility, and you've got a million in cash in it, you almost doubled your equity just mm -hmm. by starting U-Haul. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Think and about it. And you professional up because people will go by and say, oh, That's right. this isn't a crack den. There's U-Haul out front. They're safe. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it increases your occupancy an yeah. average of 5% just having U-Haul. So there's a value Good add. brand. Mm -hmm. Good How brand. about having a, a, lock, you know, a showroom with locks, boxes, tape, scissors? How about, you know, adding some climate controlled storage on that vacant land out back? You know, all those things are value adds. So, Paul, I, I want to ask this question about the operators. How do you find good operators? What are you looking for in an operator? Yeah, so we spend a lot of time getting to know these operators. We spend probably six to nine months on average. Uh, we use a lot of information from this book, The Hands Off Investor by Brian Burke. And uh, we really like that book. He, he asks a lot of hard questions. Uh, we go on word of mouth. Uh, we get references from, you know, like Ian Ippolito's site, the Real Estate Crowdfunding Review. We're not on the site because as a syndicator, like, you know, we can't be actual members, but we hear people say, hey, go check out these guys. Uh, we actually found one from a crowdfunding website. And actually, it turned out to be one of our best operators. Um, but that's how we do it. Awesome. Very cool. What would you say your best tip for someone scaling, you know, uh, asset management or getting into real estate in the early days, you know, one, two deals, where do they need to focus their time on and what's going to give them the most bang for their buck while scaling the organization? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this may not be an answer to your question, but I would definitely get involved in a great mastermind and a great coaching program. And that may well, not, that may again. give you the answers. You don't need one answer. <laughs> get with a group that'll give you all the answers. You guys, I went to a mastermind in Tampa, Florida in September, 2018. I went one time. It was a, a quarterly thing. And I just went once as a visitor and I learned so much. I'm still using it today. And I, I mean, I literally think over the next decade, I'll make millions from just that few three day thing I went to and just watching and listening to these other entrepreneurs who were crushing it so far ahead of me. And that some of them were in their like late twenties and I was my mid fifties. I know I don't look it, but, um, did I think it you're was 35, dude? No, I thought, I thought you were going to say 72 <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, uh, no, there, I can't really, you know, you, you guys, we've all heard it dozens of times, but you know, you become the average of the five people you hang around and hang around good people. I'm actually in a small town and so we've had to figure out that whole thing. But man, if you can find a mastermind or a group of peers who are crushing it and who are really putting you to shame, so to speak, I don't like that word shame. Level but, up. Shame. You know, it, shame. Shame. But it really helps because, man, when mm -hmm. I saw these 28 year olds who were crushing it, I was so motivated. I came back and revamped our whole business right after that. You're, you're talking about the one thing that was, I think, a great tip because it just defined, you know, you, you, you were in a bunch of different, you know, components of real estate, et cetera. And you said that that was one thing that really helped you. But what about a habit, something that you do that you've learned throughout your journey that you do on a daily or weekly basis that's that's led to your success? This is going to be hard to explain, but uh, Brandon Turner's coach is a guy named Jason Dries, and he's also my personal coach as well. And he is teaching me to that you don't necessarily have to grind more hours. Like if I'm grinding 60 hours a week and think I want to grow by 50%, my natural thing is I'm going to have to grind 90 hours a week. That's not true. Um, it's getting in the flow. And this sounds kind of weird or ethereal, but kind of getting in the flow of being in touch. Jedi. What's yes, yes. <laughs> No, seriously, being in touch with the universe, with Providence, with God, whoever you want to say it, basically to download ideas to me to get to the next level. And there's so many stories. There's actually a new book coming out called Memos from the Head Office by Perry Marshall, who is an internet marketing icon. 
uh, and he's talking about this. He's a left brain guy who's tapped into this kind of mysterious, you know, thing about, you know, getting ideas just by, you know, getting in touch with yourself. So for me, that boils down to journaling, like sitting quietly in the morning. And even if I'm really busy, journaling and thinking and getting mm -hmm. thinking time. I mean, Richard Branson lays in a hammock, I've heard, on an island with a yellow legal pad and he lays there. See, I got mine here. Uh, and he, but it's blank. But uh, he lays there and, and jots Where, down dude, ideas. Where's your Zen, man? Get into state, Jedi warrior. Come on. But he jots down ideas and then he hands pieces of paper, I guess, to assistants and to go implement them. And it's like, what, 500 companies or whatever he has. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to tap into more. Take it. Take it and run. I'm going back to the hammock. <laughs> See, for me, it all depends on how well I and how good I smell, really because it's all about taking a shower. So if I actually can get myself to take a shower and crank the heat up, cold showers are bullshit. I'm not doing it. If I'm in a, a hot shower, I literally, I'm like coming out, Gino, guess what? He's like, dude, we just got out of the shower, didn't you? I'm like, okay, but just listen to me, man. I got something for you. And it's just, you know. There you go. That's it. That's it. And it's just knowing that's the space. So I just need to, and it's, the problem is, I, you know, I only go to the office like once a week. So it's just actually finding that time to bathe. You know, if I get there, I'm, I'm all set. So, so I'm you guys are so talking. important. But you guys are talking about For physiology <laughs> and, and, and getting it. You're talking about physiology and getting into state. People don't know how to get into state. Physiology, you take can a control. shower. You can control your state, though, right? Get up, breathe, smile, yeah. and find your place. People are, you know, you aren't depressed. You do depress, right? So you can yes. actually control your state. People don't understand that. And how do you do that? By getting on podcasts. By surrounding yourself with other people that are going to raise your level of shirts. energy, by doing that too, but you yeah. have you have control of that, and most of us don't understand that that we have that control. It is so true, and that is such a great point. Can I get? Can you talk to my wife? <laughs> His wife can talk to your wife. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. That's good stuff. Yeah, memos from the head office. It just hit Kindle yesterday. I think I can't wait to read. I'm actually on page thirty five already. Okay, so memos from memos from the head office. Uh, Paul, what project are you excited about right now? We are getting ready to launch. And it's not so, it's something I resisted for years, guys. And I haven't told anybody this yet, except some close personal friends. You heard it here first. We're going to become a registered investment advisor and actually kind of jump to a different level of SEC scrutiny and all that. But there's come there comes with that some advantages on how we can grow our company. So we're really excited about launching that. Uh, within the next year. That's awesome. Nice. And uh, if folks want to find out more about that, where do they go? Well, we've got, you know, uh, we've, we've got an e-course on getting involved in commercial real estate. I had a really hard time, like I said early on, trying to figure out where the entry point was, you know, whether that's commercial, multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks, they can get that information at wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, wellingscapital.com forward slash resources for an e, a free e-course on self-storage, mobile home park investing, and commercial in general. Very nice. g Dad, take us home. Stenzi, you had to give me a minute for this recap because Mr. Ooh, Paul ooh, Moore is set like 72 years old. That's what he said he was. But <laughs> he's starting out as a youngster, right? Five years at a staffing company. Decides to call it quits, sells the company. He's got some cash lying around and his family's thinking, well, Paul, you got to do something. So Paul comes up with a genius idea in 2000 to start flipping homes. He's on the county courthouse all by himself. This house is great at 60. I got it for 32. Going to go back, throw a coat of paint on there, get that thing done, rip it out at 60, goes to the second one, loses money. Third one loses money, but then he finally figures it out, flips about 50 homes. Man, he's doing pretty good. 2004 comes around. I heard a cost segregation business going on. So shiny Lake object <laughs> over shiny object over shiny object. And finally, he hits the mother load. He finds multifamily and syndication. And I think that's the motherland. And now from there, continuing to grow. I mean, it's amazing the, the, the progress and, and the achievement that he's done. But I want everyone to really listen to his main point throughout this whole theme. And that is really focus on something that you really love. There's, not, there's no problem in trying things. But as you can see, you start and then you stop and you lose your momentum. And then you start again in another endeavor and lose it. Find something that you really love 
really expand upon it and then create that multifaceted approach that you can start doing it. And self-storage is, is the perfect example. Look what Paul did. He's buying these deals. He's adding U-Haul. He's got his education on it. He's doing a fund with it. He's raising capital. So there's so many different areas. But if you focus on one endeavor and become really good at it, you can conquer the world, my friend. Hey, Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Really enjoyed this. Gino is always killing it. Guys, have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.